Chapter 8 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 8 Hidden Treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field the which when a man hath found he hideth and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field in ancient times it was customary for men to hide their treasures in the earth thefts and robberies were frequent and whenever there was a change in the ruling power those who had large possessions were liable to be put under heavy tribute moreover the country was in constant danger of invasions by marauding armies as a consequence the rich endeavored to preserve their wealth by concealing it and the earth was looked upon as a safe hiding place but often the place of concealment was forgotten death might claim the owner imprisonment or exile might separate him from his treasure and the wealth he hath taken such pains to preserve was left for the fortunate finder in christ's day it was not uncommon to discover in neglected land old coins and ornaments of gold and silver a man hires land to cultivate, and as the oxen plough the soil, buried treasure is unearthed. As the man discovers the treasure, he sees that a fortune is within his reach. Restoring the gold to its hiding place, he returns to his home and sells all that he has in order to purchase the field containing the treasure. His family and his neighbors think that he is acting like a madman looking on the field they see no value in the neglected soil but the man knows what he is doing and when he has a title to the field he searches every part of it to find the treasure that he has secured this parable illustrates the value of the heavenly treasure and the effort that should be made to secure it the finder of the treasure in the field was ready to part with all that he had ready to put forth untiring labor in order to secure the hidden riches so the finder of heavenly treasure will count no labor too great and no sacrifice too dear in order to gain the treasures of truth in the parable the field containing the treasure represents the holy scriptures and the gospel is the treasure the earth itself is not so interlaced with gold veins and filled with precious things as is the word of god the treasures of the gospel are said to be hidden by those who are wise in their own estimation who are puffed up by the teaching of vain philosophy the beauty and power and mystery of the plan of redemption are not perceived many have eyes but they see not they have ears but they hear not they have intellect but they discern not the hidden treasure a man might pass over the place where treasure had been concealed in dire necessity he might sit down to rest at the foot of a tree not knowing of the riches that are hidden at its roots so it was with the jews as a golden treasure truth had been entrusted to the hebrew people the jewish economy bearing the signature of heaven had been instituted by christ himself in types and symbols the great truths of redemption were veiled yet when christ came the jews did not recognize him to whom all these symbols pointed they had the word of god in their hands but the traditions which had been handed down from generation to generation and the human interpretation of the scriptures hid from them the truth as it is in jesus the spiritual import of the sacred writings was lost the treasure-house of all knowledge was open to them but they did not know it god does not conceal his truth from men by their own course of action they make it obscure to themselves christ gave the jewish people abundant evidence that he was the messiah but his teaching called for a decided change in their lives they saw that if they received christ they must give up their cherished maxims and traditions their selfish ungodly practices it required a sacrifice to receive changeless eternal truth therefore they would not admit the most conclusive evidence that god could give to establish faith in christ they professed to believe the old testament scriptures yet they refused to accept the testimony contained therein concerning christ's life and character they were afraid of being convinced lest they should be converted and be compelled to give up their preconceived opinions the treasure of the gospel the way the truth and the life was among them but they rejected the greatest gift that heaven could bestow among the chief rulers also many believed on him we read but because of the pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue they were convinced they believed jesus to be the son of god but it was not in harmony with their ambitions 
desires to confess him. They had not the faith that would have secured for them the heavenly treasure. They were seeking worldly treasure. And today men are eagerly seeking for earthly treasure. Their minds are filled with selfish, ambitious thoughts. For the sake of gaining worldly riches, honor, or power, they place the maxims, traditions, and requirements of men above the requirements of God. From them the treasures of His word are hidden. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The Saviour saw that men were absorbed in getting gain, and were losing sight of eternal realities. He undertook to correct this evil. He sought to break the infatuating spell that was paralyzing the soul. Lifting up his voice, he cried, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He presents before fallen humanity the nobler world they have lost sight of, that they may behold eternal realities. He takes them to the threshold of the infinite, flushed with the indescribable glory of God, and shows them the treasure there. The value of this treasure is above gold or silver. The riches of the earth's mines cannot compare with it. The depth saith, It is not in me, and the sea saith, It is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystals cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. This is the treasure that is found in the scriptures. The Bible is God's great lesson book, His great educator. The foundation of all true science is contained in the Bible. Every branch of knowledge may be found by searching the word of God, and above all else it contains the science of all sciences, the science of salvation. The Bible is the mine of the unsearchable riches of Christ. The true higher education is gained by studying and obeying the word of God. But when God's word is laid aside for books that do not lead to God and the kingdom of heaven, the education acquired is a perversion of the name. There are wonderful truths in nature. The earth, the sea, and the sky are full of truth. They are our teachers. Nature utters her voice in lessons of heavenly wisdom and eternal truth. But fallen man will not understand. Sin has obscured his vision, and he cannot of himself interpret nature without placing it above God. Correct lessons cannot impress the minds of those who reject the word of God. The teaching of nature is by them so perverted that it turns the mind away from the Creator. By many, man's wisdom is thought to be higher than the wisdom of the divine teacher, and God's lesson book is looked upon as an old-fashioned, stale, and uninteresting. But by those who have been vivified by the Holy Spirit, it is not so regarded. They see the priceless treasure, and would sell all to buy the field that contains it. Instead of books containing the suppositions of reputedly great authors, they choose the word of him who is the greatest author and the greatest teacher the world has ever known, who gave his life for us, that through him we might have everlasting life. Satan works on human minds, leading them to think that there is wonderful knowledge to be gained apart from God. By deceptive reasoning, he led Adam and Eve to doubt God's word, and to supply its place with a theory that led to disobedience. And his sophistry is doing today what it did in Eden. Teachers who mingle with the education they are giving the sentiments of infidel authors plant in the minds of youth thoughts that will lead to distrust of God and transgression of his law. Little do they know what they are doing. Little do they realize what will be the result of their work. A student may go through all the grades of the schools and colleges of today. He may devote all his powers to acquiring knowledge, but unless he has a knowledge of God, unless he obeys the laws that govern his being, he will destroy himself. By wrong habits he loses his power of self-appreciation. He loses self-control. He cannot reason correctly about matters that concern him most closely. He is reckless and irrational in his treatment of mind and body. By wrong habits he makes of himself a wreck. 
Happiness he cannot have, for his neglect to cultivate pure, healthful principles places him under the control of habits that ruin his peace. His years of taxing study are lost, for he has destroyed himself. He has misused his physical and mental powers, and the temple of the body is in ruins. He is ruined for this life and for the life to come. By acquiring earthly knowledge he thought to gain a treasure, but by laying his Bible aside he sacrificed a treasure worth everything else. The word of God is to be our study. We are to educate our children in the truths found therein. It is an inexhaustible treasure, but men fail to find this treasure because they do not search until it is within their possession. Very many are content with a supposition in regard to the truth. They are content with a surface work, taking for granted that they have all that is essential. They take the sayings of others for truth, being too indolent to put themselves to diligent, earnest labor, represented in the word as digging for hidden treasure. But man's inventions are not only unreliable, they are dangerous, for they place man where God should be. They place the sayings of men where a thus saith the Lord should be. Christ is the truth, his words are truth and they have a deeper significance than appears on the surface. All the sayings of Christ have a value beyond their unpretending appearance. Minds that are quickened by the Holy Spirit will discern the value of these sayings. They will discern the precious gems of truth, though these may be buried treasures. Human theories and speculations will never lead to an understanding of God's word. Those who suppose that they understand philosophy think that their explanations are necessary to unlock the treasures of knowledge and to prevent heresies from coming into the church, but it is these explanations that have brought in false theories and heresies. Men have made desperate efforts to explain what they thought to be intricate scriptures, but too often their efforts have only darkened that which they tried to make clear. The priests and Pharisees thought they were doing great things as teachers by putting their own interpretation upon the word of God. But Christ said unto them, Ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. He charged them with the guilt of teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Though they were the teachers of the oracles of God, and though they were supposed to understand his word, they were not doers of the word. Satan had blinded their eyes that they should not see its true import. This is the work of many in our day. Many churches are guilty of this sin. There is danger, great danger, that the supposed wise men of today will repeat the experience of the Jewish teachers. They falsely interpret the divine oracles, and souls are brought into perplexity and shrouded in darkness because of their misconception of divine truth. The scriptures need not be read by the dim light of tradition or human speculation. As well might we try to give light to the sun with a torch as to explain the scriptures by human tradition or imagination. God's holy word needs not the torchlight glimmer of the earth to make its glories distinguishable. It is light in itself, the glory of God revealed, and beside it every other light is dim. But there must be earnest study and close investigation. Sharp, clear perceptions of truth will never be the reward of indolence. No earthly blessing can be obtained without earnest, patient, persevering effort. If men attain success in business, they must have a will to do, and a faith to look for results, and we cannot expect to gain spiritual knowledge without earnest toil. Those who desire to find the treasures of truth must dig for them as the miner digs for the treasure hidden in the earth. No half-hearted, indifferent work will avail. It is essential for old and young not only to read God's word, but to study it with whole-hearted earnestness, praying and searching for truth as for hidden treasure. Those who do this will be rewarded, for Christ will quicken the understanding. Our salvation depends on a knowledge of the truth contained in the scriptures. It is God's will that we should possess this. Search, O oh, search the precious Bible with hungry hearts. Explore God's word as the miner explores the earth to find veins of gold. Never give up the search until you have ascertained your relation to God and His will in regard to you. Christ declared, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Men of piety and talent catch views of eternal realities, but often they fail of understanding, because the things that are seen eclipse the glory of the unseen. He who would seek successfully for the hidden treasure must rise to higher pursuits than the things of this world. His affections and all his capabilities must be consecrated to the search. 
disobedience has closed the door to a vast amount of knowledge that might have been gained from the scriptures understanding means obedience to god's commandments the scriptures are not to be adapted to meet the prejudice and jealousy of men they can be understood only by those who are humbly seeking for a knowledge of the truth that they may obey it do you ask well, what shall i do to be saved you must lay your preconceived opinions your hereditary and cultivated ideas at the door of investigation if you search the scriptures to vindicate your own opinions you will never reach the truth search in order to learn what the lord says if conviction comes as you search if you see that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the truth do not misinterpret the truth in order to suit your own belief but accept the light given open mind and heart that you may behold wondrous things out of god's word faith in christ as the world's redeemer calls for an acknowledgment of the enlightened intellect controlled by a heart that can discern and appreciate the heavenly treasure this faith is inseparable from repentance and transformation of character to have faith means to find and accept the gospel treasure with all the obligations which it imposes except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god he may conjecture and imagine but without the eye of faith he cannot see the treasure christ gave his life to secure for us this inestimable treasure but without regeneration through faith in his blood there is no remission of sins no treasure for any perishing soul we need to the enlightenment of the holy spirit in order to discern the truths in god's word the lovely things of the natural world are not seen until the sun dispelling darkness floods them with its light so the treasures in the word of god are not appreciated until they are revealed by the bright beams of the sun of righteousness the holy spirit sent from heaven by the benevolence of infinite love takes the things of god and reveals them to every soul that has an implicit faith in christ by his power the vital truths upon which the salvation of the soul depends are impressed upon the mind and the way of life is made so plain that none need err therein as we study the scriptures we should pray for the light of God's Holy Spirit to shine upon the word that we may see and appreciate its treasures. Let none think that there is no more knowledge for them to gain. The depth of human intellect may be measured, the works of human authors may be mastered, but the highest, deepest, broadest flight of the imagination cannot find out God. There is infinity beyond all that we can comprehend we have seen only a glimmering of divine glory and of the infinitude of knowledge and wisdom we have as it were been working on the surface of the mine when rich golden ore is beneath the surface to reward the one who will dig for it the shaft must be sunk deeper and yet deeper in the mine and the result will be glorious treasure though a correct faith divine knowledge will become human knowledge no one can search the scriptures in the spirit of christ without being rewarded when man is willing to be instructed as a little child when he submits wholly to god he will find the truth in his word if men would be obedient they would understand the plan of god's government the heavenly world would open its chambers of grace and glory for exploration human beings would be altogether different from what they are now for by exploring the minds of truth men would be ennobled the mystery of redemption the incarnation of christ his atoning sacrifice would not be as they are now vague in our minds they would not be only better understood but altogether more highly appreciated in his prayer to the father christ gave the world a lesson which should be graven on the mind and soul this is life eternal he said that they might know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent this is true education it imparts power the experimental knowledge of god and of jesus christ whom he has sent transforms man into the image of god it gives to man the mastery of himself bringing every impulse and passion of the lower nature under the control of the higher powers of the mind it makes its possessor a son of god and an heir of heaven it brings him into communion with the mind of the infinite and opens to him the rich treasures of the universe this is the knowledge which is obtained by searching the word of god and this treasure may be found by every soul who will give all to obtain it if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thine voice for understanding if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures 
Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter Nine The Pearl. Based on Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46. The blessings of redeeming love our Saviour compared to a precious pearl. He illustrated his lesson by the parable of the merchantman seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Christ himself is the pearl of great price. In him is gathered all the glory of the Father, the fullness of the Godhead. He is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his person, the glory of the attributes of God is expressed in his character. Every page of the Holy Scriptures shines with his light. The righteousness of Christ as a pure white pearl has no defect, no stain. No work of man can improve the great and precious gift of God. It is without a flaw. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Footnote. Colossians 2, verse 3, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. End of footnote. All that can satisfy the needs and longings of the human soul, for this world and for the world to come, is found in Christ. Our Redeemer is the pearl so precious that in comparison all things else may be accounted loss. Christ came unto his own, and his own received him not. The light of God shone into the darkness of the world, and the darkness comprehended it not. Footnote. John 1, verses 11 and 5. End of footnote. But not all were found indifferent to the gift of heaven. The merchant man in the parable represents a class who were sincerely desiring truth. In different nations there were earnest and thoughtful men who had sought in literature and science and the religions of the heathen world for that which they could receive as the soul's treasure. Among the Jews there were those who were seeking for that which they had not. Dissatisfied with a formal religion, they longed for that which was spiritual and uplifting. Christ's chosen disciples belonged to the latter class, Cornelius and the Ethiopian eunuch to the former. They had been longing and praying for light from heaven, and when Christ was revealed to them, they received him with gladness. In the parable, the pearl is not represented as a gift. The merchant man bought it, at the price of all that he had. Many question the meaning of this, since Christ is represented in the scriptures as a gift. He is a gift, but only to those who give themselves, soul, body, and spirit to him without reserve. We are to give ourselves to Christ, to live a life of willing obedience to all his requirements. All that we are, all the talents and capabilities we possess, are the Lord's, to be consecrated to his service. When we thus give ourselves wholly to him, Christ, with all the treasures of heaven, gives himself to us. We obtain the pearl of great price. Salvation is a free gift, and yet it is to be bought and sold. In the market of which divine mercy has the management, the precious pearl is represented as being bought without money and without price. In this market all may obtain the goods of heaven. The treasury of the jewels of truth is open to all. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, the Lord declares, and no man can shut it. No sword guards the way through this door. Voices from within and at the door say, Come. The Saviour's voice earnestly and lovingly invites us. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Footnote. Revelation chapter 3, verses 8 and 18. End of footnote. The gospel of Christ is a blessing that all may possess. The poorest are as well able as the richest to purchase salvation, for no amount of worldly wealth can secure it. It is obtained by willing obedience, by giving ourselves to Christ as his own purchased possession. Education, even of the highest class, cannot of itself bring a man nearer to God. 
the Pharisees were favored with every temporal and every spiritual advantage, and they said with boastful pride, We are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Yet they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Footnote. Revelation 3, verse 17. End of footnote. Christ offered them the pearl of great price, but they disdained to accept it. And he said to them, The publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Footnote. Matthew 21, verse 31. End of footnote. We cannot earn salvation, but we are to seek for it with as much interest and perseverance as though we would abandon everything in the world for it. We are to seek for the pearl of great price, but not in worldly marts or in worldly ways. The price we are required to pay is not gold or silver, for this belongs to God. Abandon the idea that temporal or spiritual advantages will win for you salvation. God calls for your willing obedience. He asks you to give up your sins. To him that overcometh, Christ declares, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Footnote. Revelation 3, verse 21. End of footnote. There are some who seem to be always seeking for the heavenly pearl, but they do not make an entire surrender of their wrong habits. They do not die to self that Christ may live in them. Therefore they do not find the precious pearl. They have not overcome unholy ambition and their love for worldly attractions. They do not take up the cross and follow Christ in the path of self-denial and sacrifice. Almost Christians, yet not fully Christians, they seem near the kingdom of heaven, but they cannot enter there. Almost but not wholly saved means to be not almost but wholly lost. The parable of the merchantman seeking goodly pearls has a double significance. It applies not only to men as seeking the kingdom of heaven, but to Christ as seeking his lost inheritance. Christ, the heavenly merchantman, seeking goodly pearls, saw in lost humanity the pearl of price. In man, defiled and ruined by sin, he saw the possibilities of redemption. Hearts that have been the battleground of the conflict with Satan, and that have been rescued by the power of love, are more precious to the Redeemer than are those who have never fallen. God looked upon humanity, not as vile and worthless. He looked upon it in Christ, saw it as it might become through redeeming love. He collected all the riches of the universe and laid them down in order to buy the pearl. And Jesus, having found it, resets it in his own diadem. For they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Footnote, Zechariah 9, verse 16, and Malachi 3, verse 17. End of footnote. But Christ as the precious pearl, and our privilege of possessing this heavenly treasure, is the theme on which we most need to dwell. It is the Holy Spirit that reveals to men the preciousness of the goodly pearl. The time of the Holy Spirit's power is the time when, in a special sense, the heavenly gift is sought and found. In Christ's day, many heard the gospel, but their minds were darkened by false teaching, and they did not recognize in the humble teacher of Galilee the scent of God. But after Christ's ascension, his enthronement in his mediatorial kingdom was signalized by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost the Spirit was given. Christ's witnesses proclaimed the power of the risen Savior. The light of heaven penetrated the darkened minds of those who had been deceived by the enemies of Christ. They now saw him exalted to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Footnote. Acts 5, verse 31. End of footnote. They saw him encircled with the glory of heaven, with infinite treasures in his hands to bestow upon all who would turn from their rebellion. As the apostles set forth the glory of the only begotten of the Father, three thousand souls were convicted. They were made to see themselves as they were, sinful and polluted, and Christ as their friend and redeemer. Christ was lifted up, Christ was glorified, through the power of the Holy Spirit resting upon men. By faith, these believers saw him as the one who had borne humiliation, suffering, and death, that they might not perish but have everlasting life. The revelation of Christ by the Spirit brought to them a realizing sense of his power and majesty, and they stretched forth their hands to him by faith, 
saying, I believe. Then the glad tidings of a risen Saviour were carried to the uttermost bounds of the inhabited world. The church beheld converts flocking to her from all directions. Believers were reconverted, sinners united with Christians in seeking the pearl of great price. The prophecy was fulfilled, the weak shall be as David, and the house of David as the angel of the Lord. Footnote. Zechariah 12, verse 8. End of footnote. Every Christian saw in his brother the divine similitude of benevolence and love. One interest prevailed. One object swallowed up all others. All hearts beat in harmony. The only ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Footnote. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 and 33, and chapter 2, verse 47. End of footnote. The Spirit of Christ animated the whole congregation, for they had found the pearl of great price. These scenes are to be repeated, and with greater power. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the former rain, but the latter rain will be more abundant. The Spirit awaits our demand and reception. Christ is again to be revealed in His fullness by the Holy Spirit's power. Men will discern the value of the precious pearl, and with the Apostle Paul they will say, What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Footnote. Philippians, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. End of footnote. End of chapter 9. Chapter 10 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. Baldwin. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 10. The Net. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which, when it was full, they drew to shore, and sat down, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth, and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The casting of the net is the preaching of the gospel. This gathers both good and evil into the church. When the mission of the gospel is completed, the judgment will accomplish the work of separation. Christ saw how the existence of false brethren in the church would cause the way of truth to be evil spoken of. The world would revile the gospel because of the inconsistent lives of false professors. Even Christians would be caused to stumble as they saw that many who bore Christ's name were not controlled by his spirit. Because these sinners were in the church, men would be in danger of thinking that God excused their sins. Therefore Christ lifts the veil from the future and bids all to behold that it is character, not position, which decides man's destiny. Both the parable of the tares and that of the net plainly teach that there is no time when all the wicked will turn to God. The wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. The good and the bad fish are together drawn ashore for a final separation. Again these parables teach that there is to be no probation after the judgment. When the work of the gospel is completed, there immediately follows the separation between the good and the evil, and the destiny of each class is forever fixed. God does not desire the destruction of any. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die? Throughout the period of probationary time, his spirit is entreating men to accept the gift of life. It is only those who reject his pleading that will be left to perish. God has declared that sin must be destroyed as an evil ruinous to the universe. Those who cling to sin will perish in its destruction. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Christ's Object Lessons This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Lothridge. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Things New and Old. While Christ was teaching the people, he was also educating his disciples for their future work. In all his instruction, there were lessons for them. After giving the parable of the net, he asked them, Have ye understood all these things? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then in another parable, he set before them their responsibility in regard to the truths they had received. Therefore, he said, Every scribe which is instructed into the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. The treasure gained by the householder he does not hoard, but brings it forth to communicate to others, and by use the treasure increases. The householder has precious things both new and old, so Christ teaches that the truth committed to his disciples is to be communicated to the world. And as the knowledge of truth is imparted, it will increase. All who receive the gospel message into the heart will long to proclaim it. The heaven-born love of Christ must find expression. Those who have put on Christ will relate their experience, tracing step by step the leadings of the Holy Spirit, their hungering and thirsting for the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ whom he has sent, the result of their searching of the scriptures, their prayers, their soul agony, and the words of Christ to them. Thy sins be forgiven thee. It is unnatural for any to keep these things secret, and those who are filled with the love of Christ will not do so. In proportion as the Lord has made them the depositaries of sacred truth will be their desire that others shall receive the same blessing. And as they make known the rich treasures of God's grace, more and still more of the grace of Christ will be imparted to them. They will have the heart of a little child in its simplicity and unreserved obedience. Their souls will pant after holiness and more and more of treasures of truth and grace will be revealed to them to be given to the world. The great storehouse of truth is the word of God, the written word, the book of nature, and the book of experience in God's dealing with human life. Here are the treasures from which Christ's workers are to draw. In the search after truth, they are to depend upon God, not upon human intelligences, the great men whose wisdom is foolishness with God. Through his own appointed channels, the Lord will impart a knowledge of himself to every seeker. If the follower of Christ will believe his word and practice it, there is no science in the natural world that he will not be able to grasp and appreciate. There is nothing but that will furnish him means for imparting the truth to others. Natural science is a treasure house of knowledge from which every student in the school of Christ may draw. As we contemplate the beauty of nature, as we study its lessons in the cultivation of the soil, in the growth of the trees, and all the wonders of earth and sea and sky, there will come to us a new perception of truth, and the mysteries connected with God's dealings with men and the depths of his wisdom and judgment as seen in human life. These are found to be a storehouse rich in treasure. But it is in the written word that a knowledge of God is most clearly revealed to fallen man. This is the treasure house of the unsearchable riches of Christ. The Word of God includes the Scripture of the Old Testament as well as of the New. One is not complete without the other. Christ declared that the truths of the Old Testament are as valuable as those of the New. Christ was as much man's Redeemer in the beginning of the world as he is today. Before he clothed his divinity with humanity and came to our world, the Gospel message was given by Adam, Seth, Enoch, Methuselah, and Noah, Abraham and Canaan, and Lot and Sodom, were the message, and from generation to generation, faithful messengers proclaimed the coming one. The rights of the Jewish economy were instituted by Christ himself. He was the foundation of their system of sacrificial offerings, the great antitype of all their religious service. The blood shed as the sacrifices were offered pointed to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. All the typical offerings were fulfilled in him. Christ is manifested to the patriarchs, as symbolized in the sacrificial service, as portrayed in the law and as revealed by the prophet, is the riches of the Old Testament. Christ in his life, his death, and his resurrection, Christ as he is manifested by the Holy Spirit, is the treasure of the New Testament. Our Savior, the outshining of the Father's glory, is both the Old and the New. 
Of Christ's life and death and intercession, which prophets had foretold, the apostles were to go forth as witnesses. Christ in his humiliation, in his purity and holiness, in his matchless love, was to be their theme. And in order to preach the gospel in its fullness, they must present the Savior not only as revealed in his life and teachings, but as foretold by the prophets of the Old Testament and as symbolized by the sacrificial service. Christ in his teaching presented old truths of which he himself was the originator, truths which he had spoken through patriarchs and prophets, but he now shed upon them a new light. How different appeared their meaning! A flood of light and spirituality was brought in by his explanation, and he promised that the Holy Spirit should enlighten the disciples, that the word of God should be ever unfolding to them. They would be able to present its truths in new beauty. Ever since the first promise of redemption was spoken in Eden, the life, the character, and the mediatorial work of Christ have been the study of human minds. Yet every mind through whom the Holy Spirit has worked has presented these themes in a light that is fresh and new. The truths of redemption are capable of constant development and expansion. Though old, they are ever new, constantly revealing to the seeker for truth a greater glory and a mightier power. In every age there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began, As Moses and all the prophets, and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. There are those who profess to believe and to teach the truths of the Old Testament while they reject the new. But in refusing to receive the teachings of Christ, they show that they do not believe that which patriarchs and prophets have spoken. Had ye believed Moses, Christ said, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Hence there is no real power in their teaching of even the Old Testament. Many who claim to believe and to teach the gospel are in a similar error. They set aside the Old Testament scriptures, of which Christ declared, They are they which testify of me. In rejecting the old, they virtually reject the new, for both are parts of an inseparable world. No man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel, or the gospel without the law. The law is the gospel embodied, and the gospel is the law unfolded. The law is the root, the gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which it bears. The Old Testament sheds light upon the new, and the new upon the old. Each is a revelation of the glory of God in Christ. Both present truths that will continually reveal new depths of meaning to the earnest seeker. Truth in Christ and through Christ is measureless. The student of Scripture looks, as it were, into a fountain that deepens and broadens as he gazes into its depths. Not in this life shall we comprehend the mystery of God's love in giving his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The work of our Redeemer on this earth is, and ever will be, a subject that will put to the stretch our highest imagination. Man may tax every mental power and endeavor to fathom this mystery, but his mind will become faint and weary. The most diligent searcher will see before him a boundless, shoreless sea. The truth as it is in Jesus can be experienced, but never explained. Its height and breadth and depth pass our knowledge. We may task our imagination to the utmost, and then we shall only see dimly the outlines of a love that is unexplainable, that is as high as heaven, but that stoop to the earth to stamp the image of God on all mankind. Yet it is possible for us to see all that we can bear of the divine compassion. This is unfolded to the humble, contrite soul. We shall understand God's compassion just in proportion as we appreciate his sacrifice for us. As we search the word of God in humility of heart, the grand theme of redemption will open to our research. It will increase in brightness as we behold it, and as we aspire to grasp it, its height and depth will ever increase. Our life is to be bound up with the life of Christ. We are to draw constantly from him, partaking of him, the living bread that came down from heaven, drawing from a fountain of ever fresh, ever giving forth its abundant treasures. If we keep the Lord ever before us, 
allowing our hearts to go out in thanksgiving and praise to him, we shall have a continual freshness of our religious life. Our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk with a friend. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Often our hearts will burn within us as he draws nigh to commune with us as he did with Enoch. When this is in truth the experience of the Christian, there is seen in his life a simplicity, a humility, meekness, and lowliness of heart that show to all with whom he associates that he has been with Jesus and learned of him. In those who possess it, the religion of Christ will reveal itself as a vitalizing, pervading principle, a living, working spiritual energy. There will be manifest the freshness and power of joyousness, of perpetual youth. The heart that receives the word of God is not as a pool that evaporates, not like a broken cistern that loses its treasure. It is like the mountain stream fed by unfailing springs, whose cool, sparkling waters leap from rock to rock, refreshing the weary, the thirsty, the heavy laden. This experience gives every teacher of truth the very qualifications that will make him a representative of Christ. The spirit of Christ's teachings will give a force and directness to his communications and to his prayers. His witness to Christ will not be a narrow, lifeless testimony. The minister will not preach over and over the same set of discourses. His mind will be open to the constant illumination of the Holy Spirit. Christ said, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. When we eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood, the element of eternal life will be found in the ministry. There will not be a fund of stale, oft-repeated ideas. The tame, dull sermonizing will cease. The old truths will be presented, but they will be seen in a new light. There will be a new perception of truth, a clearness and a power that all will discern. Those who have the privilege of sitting under such a ministry will, if susceptible to the Holy Spirit's influence, feel the energizing power of a new life. The fire of God's love will be kindred within them. The perceptive faculties will be quickened to discern the beauty and majesty of truth. The faithful householder represents what every teacher of the children and youth should be. If he makes the world of God his treasure, he will continually bring forth new beauty and new truth. When the teacher will rely upon God in prayer, the Spirit of Christ will come upon him, and God will work through him by the Holy Spirit upon the minds of others. The Spirit fills the mind and heart with sweet hope and courage and Bible imagery, and all this will be communicated to the youth under his instruction. The springs of heavenly peace and joy, unsealed in the soul of the teacher by the words of inspiration, will become a mighty river of influence to bless all who connect with him. The Bible will not become a tiresome book to the student. Under a wise instructor, the word will become more and more desirable. It will be as the bread of life and will never grow old. Its freshness and beauty will attract and charm the children and youth. It is like the sun shining upon the earth, perpetually imparting brightness and warmth, yet never exhausted. God's holy educating spirit is in his word. A light, a new and precious light, shines forth from every page. Truth is there revealed and words and sentences are made bright and appropriate for the occasion as the voice of God speaking to the soul. The Holy Spirit loves to address the youth and to discover to them the treasures and beauty of God's word. The promises spoken by the great teacher will captivate the senses and animate the soul with the spiritual power that is divine. There will grow in the fruitful mind a familiarity with the divine things that will be as a barricade against temptation. The words of truth will grow in importance and assume a breadth and fullness of meaning of which we have never dreamed. The beauty and riches of the world have a transforming influence on mind and character. The light of heavenly love will fall upon the heart as an inspiration. The appreciation of the Bible grows with its study. Whichever way the student may turn, he will find displayed the infinite wisdom and love of God. The significance of the Jewish economy is not yet fully comprehended. Truths vast and profound are shadowed forth in its rites and symbols. 
The gospel is the key that unlocks its mysteries. Through a knowledge of the plan of redemption, its truths are open to the understanding. Far more than we do, it is our privilege to understand these wonderful themes. We are to comprehend the deep things of God. Angels desire to look into the truths that are revealed to the people who with contrite hearts are searching the word of God and praying for greater lengths and breadths and depths and heights of knowledge, which he alone can give. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. The last book of the New Testament scriptures is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study. But Christ, through his servant John, has been declared what shall be in the last days. And he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. This is life eternal, Christ said, that they may know thee, and only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Why is it that we do not realize the value of this knowledge? Why are not these glorious truths glowing in our heart, trembling upon our lips, and pervading our whole being? In giving us his word, God has put us in possession of every truth essential for our salvation. Thousands have drawn water from these wells of life, yet there is no diminishing of the supply. Thousands have set the Lord before them, and by beholding, have been changed into the same image. Their spirit burns within them as they speak of his character, telling what Christ is to them, and what they are to Christ. But these searchers have not exhausted these grand and holy themes. Thousands more may engage in the work of searching out the mysteries of salvation. As the life of Christ and the character of his mission are dwelt upon, rays of light will shine forth more distinctly at every attempt to discover truth. Each fresh search will reveal something more deeply interesting than has yet been unfolded. The subject is inexhaustible. The study of the incarnation of Christ, his atoning sacrifice, and the mediatorial work will employ the mind of the diligent student as long as time shall last. And looking to heaven with its unnumbered years, you will exclaim, Great is the mystery of godliness. In eternity we shall learn that which, had we received the enlightenment it was possible to obtain here, would have opened our understanding. The themes of redemption will employ the hearts and minds and tongues of the redeemed through the everlasting ages. They will understand the truths which Christ longed to open to his disciples, but which they did not have faith to grasp. Forever and forever new views of the perfection and glory of Christ will appear. Through the endless ages will the faithless householder bring forth from his treasure things new and old. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 12 Asking to Give. Christ was continually receiving from the Father that he might communicate to us. The word which ye hear, he said, is not mine, but the Father's which sent to me. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Not for himself, but for others, he lived and thought and prayed. From hours spent with God he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the early hours of the new day the Lord awakened him from his slumbers, and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. His words were given him fresh from the heavenly courts words that he might speak in season to the weary and oppressed. The Lord God hath given me, he said, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Christ's disciples were much impressed by his prayers and by his habit of communion with God. One day after a short absence from their Lord they found him absorbed in supplication. Seeming unconscious of their presence, he continued praying aloud. The hearts of the disciples were deeply moved. As he ceased praying, they exclaimed, Lord, teach us to pray. In answer, Christ repeated the Lord's prayer as he had given it in the Sermon on the Mount. Then in a parable he illustrated the lesson he desired to teach them. 
Which of you, he said, shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Here Christ represents the petitioner as asking that he may give again. He must obtain the bread, else he cannot supply the necessities of a weary, belated wayfarer. Though his neighbor is unwilling to be troubled, he will not desist his pleading. His friend must be relieved, and at last his importunity is rewarded. His wants are supplied. In like manner the disciples were to seek blessings from God. In the feeding of the multitude and in the sermon on the bread from heaven, Christ had opened to them their work as his representatives. They were to give the bread of life to the people. He who had appointed their work saw how often their faith would be tried. Often they would be thrown into unexpected positions and would realize their human insufficiency. Souls that were hungering for the bread of life would come to them and they would feel themselves to be destitute and helpless. They must receive spiritual food or they would have nothing to impart. But they were not to turn one soul away unfed. Christ directs them to the source of supply. The man whose friend came to him for entertainment even at the unseasonable hour of midnight did not turn him away. He had nothing to set before him, but he went to one who had food and pressed his request until the neighbor supplied his need. And would not God, who had set his servants to feed the hungry, supply their need for his own work? But the selfish neighbor in the parable does not represent the character of God. The lesson is drawn not by comparison, but by contrast. A selfish man will grant an urgent request in order to rid himself of one who disturbs his rest. But God delights to give. He is full of compassion, and he longs to grant the requests of those who come unto him in faith. He gives to us that we may minister to others, and thus become like himself. Christ declares, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. The Saviour continues, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer to him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? In order to strengthen our confidence in God, Christ teaches us to address him by a new name a name entwined with the dearest associations of the human heart. He gives us the privilege of calling the infinite God our Father. This name, spoken to Him and of Him, is a sign of our love and trust toward Him and a pledge of His regard and relationship to us. Spoken when asking His favor or blessing, it is His music in His ears. That we might not think it presumption to call Him by this name, He has repeated it again and again. He desires us to become familiar with the appellation. God regards us as His children. He has redeemed us out of the careless world and has chosen us to become members of the royal family, sons and daughters of the heavenly King. He invites us to trust in Him with a trust deeper and stronger than that of a child in His earthly father. Parents love their children, but the love of God is larger, broader, deeper than human love can possibly be. It is immeasurable. Then if earthly parents know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more shall our Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Christ's lessons in regard to prayer should be carefully considered. There is a divine science in prayer, and His illustration brings to view principles that all need to understand. He shows what is the true spirit of prayer. He teaches the necessity of perseverance in presenting our request to God, and assures us of His willingness to hear and answer prayer. Our prayers are not to be a selfish asking, merely for our own benefit. We are to ask that we may give. The principle of Christ's life must be the principle of our lives. For their sakes, he said, speaking of his disciples, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified. This same devotion, this same self-sacrifice, this same subjection to the claims of the Word of God that were manifest in Christ, must be seen in his servants. Our mission to the world is not to serve or please ourselves. We are to glorify God by cooperating with Him to save sinners. We are to ask blessings from God that we may communicate to others. The capacity for receiving is preserved only by imparting. 
we cannot continue to receive heavenly treasure without communicating to those around us. In the parable the petitioner was again and again repulsed, but he did not relinquish his purpose. So our prayers do not always seem to receive an immediate answer, but Christ teaches that we should not cease to pray. Prayer is not to work any change in God, it is to bring us into harmony with God. When we make request of Him, He may see that it is necessary for us to search our hearts and repent of sin. Therefore He takes us through test and trial. He brings us through humiliation that we may see what hinders the working of His Holy Spirit through us. There are conditions to the fulfillment of God's promises, and prayer can never take the place of duty. If ye love me, Christ says, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Those who bring their petitions to God, claiming his promise, while they do not comply with the conditions, insult Jehovah. They bring the name of Christ as their authority for the fulfillment of the promise, but they do not those things that would show faith in Christ and love for him. Many are forfeiting the condition of acceptance with the Father. We need to examine closely the deed of trust wherewith we approach God. If we are disobedient, we bring to the Lord a note to be cashed when we have not fulfilled the conditions that would make it payable to us. We present to God His promises and ask Him to fulfill them when by doing so He would dishonor His own name. The promise is, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And John declares, Hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. One of Christ's last commands to his disciples was, Love one another as I have loved you. Do we obey this command, or are we indulging in unchristlike traits of character? If we have in any way grieved or wounded others, it is our duty to confess our fault and seek for reconciliation. This is an essential preparation that we may come before God in faith to ask His blessing. There is another matter too often neglected by those who seek the Lord in prayer. Have you been honest with God? By the prophet Malachi the Lord declares, Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye say, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. As the giver of every blessing, God claims a certain portion of all we possess. This is his provision to sustain the preaching of the gospel. And by making this return to God, we are to show our appreciation of his gifts. But if we withhold from him that which is his own, how can we claim his blessing? If we are unfaithful stewards of earthly things, how can we expect him to entrust us with the things of heaven? It may be that here is the secret of unanswered prayer. But the Lord in his great mercy is ready to forgive. And he says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field. And all nations shall call you blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So it is with every other one of God's requirements. All his gifts are promised on condition of obedience. God has a heaven full of blessings for those who will cooperate with him. All who obey him may with confidence claim the fulfillment of his promises, but we must show a firm undeviating trust in God. Often he delays to answer us in order to try our faith or test the genuineness of our desire. Having asked according to his word, we should believe his promise and press our petitions with a determination that will not be denied. God does not say, Ask once and you shall receive. He bids us ask, unwearyingly persist in prayer. Persistent asking brings the petitioner into a more earnest attitude and gives him an increased desire to receive the things for which he asks. Christ said to Martha at the grave of Lazarus, If thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. But many have not a living faith. This is why they do not see more of the power of God. Their weakness is the result of their unbelief. They have more faith in their own working than in the working of God for them. They take themselves into their own keeping. 
They plan and devise, but pray little, and have little real trust in God. They think they have faith, but it is only the impulse of the moment. Failing to realize their own need, or God's willingness to give, they do not persevere in keeping their requests before the Lord. Our prayers are to be as earnest and persistent as was the petition of the needy friend who asked for the loaves at midnight. The more earnestly and steadfastly we ask, the closer will be our spiritual union with Christ. We shall receive increased blessings because we have increased faith. Our part is to pray and believe. Watch unto prayer. Watch and cooperate with the prayer hearing God. Bear in mind that we are laborers together with God. Speak and act in harmony with your prayers. It will make an infinite difference with you whether trials shall prove your faith to be genuine or show that your prayers are only a form. When perplexities arise and difficulties confront you, look not for help to humanity. Trust all with God. The practice of telling our difficulties to others only makes us weak and brings no strength to them. It lays upon them the burden of our spiritual infirmities which they cannot relieve. We seek the strength of erring, finite man when we might have the strength of the unerring, infinite God. You need not to go to the ends of the earth for wisdom, for God is near. It is not the capabilities you now possess or ever will have that will give you success. It is that which the Lord can do for you. We need to have far less confidence in what man can do and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. He longs to have you reach after him by faith. He longs to give you understanding in temporal as well as in spiritual matters. He can sharpen the intellect. He can give tact and skill. Put your talents into the work. Ask God for wisdom and it will be given you. Take the word of Christ as your assurance. Has he not invited you to come to him? Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. If you do, you will lose much. By looking at appearances and complaining when difficulties and pressure come, you give evidence of a sickly and feebled faith. Talk and act as if your faith was invincible. The Lord is rich in resources. He owns the world. Look heavenward in faith. Look to him who has light and power and efficiency. There is in genuine faith a buoyancy a steadfastness of principle and a fixedness of purpose that neither time nor toil can weaken. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall man up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. There are many who long to help others, but they feel that they have no spiritual strength or light to impart. Let them present their petitions at the throne of grace. Plead for the Holy Spirit. God stands back of every promise he has made. With your Bible in your hands, say, I have done as thou hast said. I present thy promise. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. We must not only pray in Christ's name, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This explains what is meant when it is said that the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Such prayer God delights to answer. When with earnestness and intensity we breathe a prayer in the name of Christ, there is in that very intensity a pledge from God that he is about to answer our prayer exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Christ has said, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And the beloved John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks with great plainness and assurance. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Then press your petition to the Father in the name of Jesus. God will honor that name. The rainbow round about the throne is an assurance that God is true, that in him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We have sinned against him, and are undeserving of his favor, yet he himself has put into our lips that most wonderful of pleas. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. When we come to him confessing our unworthiness and sin, he has pledged himself to give heed to our cry. The honor of his throne is staked for the fulfillment of his word unto us. Like Aaron, who symbolized Christ, our Savior bears the names of all his people on his heart in the holy place. Our great high priest remembers all the words by which he has encouraged us to trust. 
he is ever mindful of his covenant. All who seek of him shall find, all who knocked will have the door open to them. The excuse will not be made, trouble me not, the door is closed, I do not wish to open it. Never will one be told, I cannot help you. Those who beg at midnight for loaves to feed the hungry souls will be successful. In the parable he who asks bread for the stranger receives as many as he needeth. And in what measure will God impart to us that we may impart to others? According to the measure of the gift of Christ, angels are watching with intense interest to see how man is dealing with his fellow men. When they see one manifest Christ-like sympathy for the erring, they press to his side and bring to his remembrance words to speak that will be as the bread of life to the soul. So God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Your testimony and its genuineness and reality he will make powerful in the power of the life to come. The word of the Lord will be your mouth as truth and righteousness. Personal effort for others should be preceded by much secret prayer for it requires great wisdom to understand the science of saving souls. Before communicating with men, commune with Christ. At the throne of heavenly grace obtain a preparation for ministering to the people. Let your heart break for the longing it has for God, for the living God. The life of Christ has shown what humanity can do by being partaker of the divine nature. All that Christ received from God we too may have. Then ask and receive. With the persevering faith of Jacob, with the unyielding persistence of Elijah, claim for yourself all that God has promised. Let the glorious conceptions of God possess your mind. Let your life be knit by hidden links to the life of Jesus. He who commanded the light to shine out of darkness is willing to shine in your heart, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will take the things of God and show them unto you, conveying them as a living power into the obedient heart. Christ will lead you to the threshold of the infinite. You may behold the glory beyond the veil, and reveal to men the sufficiency of him who ever liveth to make intercession for us. End of chapter 12. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 13 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. L. Baldwin. Christ's Object Lessons. Chapter 13. Two Worshippers. Unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, Christ spoke the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee goes up to the temple to worship, not because he feels that he is a sinner in need of pardon, but because he thinks himself righteous and hopes to win commendation. His worship he regards as an act of merit that will recommend him to God. At the same time it will give the people a high opinion of his piety. He hopes to secure favor with both God and man. His worship is prompted by self-interest. And he is full of self-praise. He looks it, he walks it, he prays it. Drawing apart from others as if to say, Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou, he stands and prays with himself. Wholly self-satisfied, he thinks that God and men regard him with the same complacency. God, I thank thee, he says, that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. He judges his character not by the holy character of God, but by the character of other men. His mind is turned away from God to humanity. This is the secret of his self-satisfaction. He proceeds to recount his good deeds. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The religion of the Pharisee does not touch the soul. He is not seeking God-likeness of character, a heart filled with love and mercy. He is satisfied with a religion that has to do only with the outward life. His righteousness is his own, the fruit of his own works, and judged by a human standard. Whoever trusts in himself that he is righteous will despise others. As the Pharisee judges himself by other men, so he judges other men by himself. His righteousness is estimated by theirs, and the worse they are, the more righteous by contrast he appears. His self-righteousness leads to accusing. Other men he condemns as transgressors of God's law. Thus he is making manifest the very spirit of Satan, the accuser of the brethren. 
With this spirit it is impossible for him to enter into communion with God. He goes down to his house destitute of the divine blessing. The publican had gone to the temple with other worshippers, but he soon drew apart from them as unworthy to unite in their devotions. Standing afar off, he would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, in bitter anguish and self-abhorrence. He felt that he had transgressed against God, that he was sinful and polluted. He could not expect even pity from those around him, for they looked upon him with contempt. He knew that he had no merit to commend him to God, and in utter self-despair he cried, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He did not compare himself with others. Overwhelmed with a sense of guilt, he stood as if alone in God's presence. His only desire was for pardon and peace. His only plea was the mercy of God. And he was blessed. I tell you, Christ said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The Pharisee and the publican represent two great classes into which those who come to worship God are divided. Their first two representatives are found in the first two children that were born into the world. Cain thought himself righteous, and he came to God with a thank-offering only. He made no confession of sin, and acknowledged no need of mercy. But Abel came with the blood that pointed to the Lamb of God. He came as a sinner, confessing himself lost. His only hope was the unmerited love of God. The Lord had respect to his offering, but to Cain and his offering he had not respect. The sense of need, the recognition of our poverty and sin, is the very first condition of acceptance with God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For each of the classes represented by the Pharisee and the publican, there is a lesson in the history of the Apostle Peter. In his early discipleship, Peter thought himself strong. Like the Pharisee, in his own estimation, he was not as other men are. When Christ, on the eve of his betrayal, forewarned his disciples, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, Peter confidently declared, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Peter did not know his own danger. Self-confidence misled him. He thought himself able to withstand temptation. But in a few short hours the test came, and with cursing and swearing he denied his Lord. When the crowing of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ, surprised and shocked at what he had just done, he turned and looked at his master. At that moment Christ looked at Peter, and beneath that grieved look, in which compassion and love for him were blended, Peter understood himself. He went out and wept bitterly. That look of Christ's broke his heart. Peter had come to the turning point, and bitterly did he repent his sin. He was like the publican in his contrition and repentance, and like the publican he found mercy. The look of Christ assured him of pardon. Now his self-confidence was gone. Never again were the old boastful assertions repeated. Christ, after his resurrection, thrice tested Peter. Simon, son of Jonas, he said, Lovest thou me more than these? Peter did not now exalt himself above his brethren. He appealed to the one who could read his heart. Lord, he said, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Then he received his commission. A work broader and more delicate than had heretofore been his was appointed him. Christ bade him feed the sheep and the lambs. In thus committing to his stewardship the souls for whom the Saviour had laid down his own life, Christ gave to Peter the strongest proof of confidence in his restoration. The once restless, boastful, self-confident disciple had become subdued and contrite. Henceforth he followed his Lord in self-denial and self-sacrifice. He was a partaker of Christ's sufferings, and when Christ shall sit upon the throne of his glory, Peter will be a partaker in his glory. The evil that led to Peter's fall, and that shut out the Pharisee from communion with God, is proving the ruin of thousands today. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins it is the most hopeless, the most incurable. Peter's fall was not instantaneous, but gradual. Self-confidence led him to the belief that he was saved, and step after step was taken in the downward path until he could deny his master. Never can we safely put confidence in self, or feel this side of heaven that we are secure against temptation. 
those who accept the Saviour, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or to feel that they are saved. This is misleading. Every one should be taught to cherish hope and faith. But even when we give ourselves to Christ and know that He accepts us, we are not beyond the reach of temptation. God's word declares, Many shall be purified, and made white, and tried. Only he who endures the trial will receive the crown of life. Those who accept Christ, and in their first confidence say, I am saved, are in danger of trusting to themselves. They lose sight of their own weakness and their constant need of divine strength. They are unprepared for Satan's devices, and under temptation many, like Peter, fall into the very depths of sin. We are admonished, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Our only safety is in constant distrust of self and dependence on Christ. It was necessary for Peter to learn his own defects of character and his need of the power and grace of Christ. The Lord could not save him from trial, but he could have saved him from defeat. Had Peter been willing to receive Christ's warning, he would have been watching unto prayer. He would have walked with fear and trembling lest his feet should stumble. And he would have received divine help so that Satan could not have gained the victory. It was through self-sufficiency that Peter fell, and it was through repentance and humiliation that his feet were again established. In the record of his experience, every repenting sinner may find encouragement. Though Peter had grievously sinned, he was not forsaken. The words of Christ were written upon his soul, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. In his bitter agony of remorse, this prayer and the memory of Christ's look of love and pity gave him hope. Christ, after his resurrection, remembered Peter, and gave the angel the message for the women, Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him. Peter's repentance was accepted by the sin-pardoning Saviour. And the same compassion that reached out to rescue Peter is extended to every soul who has fallen under temptation. It is Satan's special device to lead man into sin, and then leave him helpless and trembling, fearing to seek for pardon. But why should we fear when God has said, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me? Every provision has been made for our infirmities. Every encouragement offered us to come to Christ. Christ offered up his broken body to purchase back God's heritage, to give man another trial. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. By his spotless life, his obedience, his death on the cross of Calvary, Christ interceded for the lost race. And now, not as a mere petitioner does the captain of our salvation intercede for us, but as a conqueror claiming his victory. His offering is complete, and as our intercessor he executes his self-appointed work, holding before God the censer containing his own spotless merits and the prayers, confessions, and thanksgiving of his people. Perfumed with the fragrance of his righteousness, these ascend to God as a sweet savor. The offering is wholly acceptable, and pardon covers all transgression. Christ has pledged himself to be our substitute and surety, and he neglects no one. He who could not see human beings exposed to eternal ruin without pouring out his soul into death in their behalf, will look with pity and compassion upon every soul who realizes that he cannot save himself. He will look upon no trembling suppliant without raising him up. He who through his own atonement provided for man an infinite fund of moral power will not fail to employ this power in our behalf. We may take our sins and sorrows to his feet, for he loves us. His every look and word invites our confidence. He will shape and mold our characters according to his own will. In the whole satanic force there is not power to overcome one soul who in simple trust casts himself on Christ. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord says, Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. 
But we must have a knowledge of ourselves, a knowledge that will result in contrition, before we can find pardon and peace. The Pharisee felt no conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit could not work with him. His soul was encased in a self-righteous armor which the arrows of God, barbed and true-aimed by angel hands, failed to penetrate. It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. He came to heal the broken-hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. But they that are whole need not a physician. We must know our real condition, or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger, or we shall not flee to the refuge. We must feel the pain of our wounds, or we shall not desire healing. The Lord says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. The gold tried in the fire is faith that works by love. Only this can bring us into harmony with God. We may be active, we may do much work, but without love, such love as dwelt in the heart of Christ, we can never be numbered with the family of heaven. No man can of himself understand his errors. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with the conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. It is ignorance of Him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate His purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness like every other sinner. We shall see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but through God's infinite grace. The prayer of the publican was heard because it showed dependence reaching forth to lay hold upon omnipotence. Self to the publican appeared nothing but shame. Thus it must be seen by all who seek God. By faith faith that renounces all self-trust, the needy suppliant is to lay hold upon infinite power. No outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. It is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward it is to be renewed. All our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual earnest heart-breaking confession of sin, and humbling of the soul before Him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. The nearer we come to Jesus, the more clearly we discern the purity of His character, the more clearly we shall discern the exceeding sinfulness of sin, and the less we shall feel like exalting ourselves. Those whom heaven recognizes as holy ones are the last to parade their own goodness. The Apostle Peter became a faithful minister of Christ, and he was greatly honored with divine light and power. He had an active part in the upholding of Christ's church, but Peter never forgot the fearful experience of his humiliation. His sin was forgiven, yet well he knew that for the weakness of character which had caused his fall, only the grace of Christ could avail. He found in himself nothing in which to glory. None of the apostles or prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Men who have lived nearest to God, men who would sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act, men whom God had honored with divine light and power, have confessed the sinfulness of their own nature. They have put no confidence in the flesh, 
have claimed no righteousness of their own, but have trusted wholly in the righteousness of Christ. So will it be with all who behold Christ. At every advanced step in Christian experience our repentance will deepen. It is to those whom the Lord has forgiven, to those whom he acknowledges as his people, that he says, Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. Again he says, I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame, when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. Then our lips will not be opened in self-glorification. We shall know that our sufficiency is in Christ alone. We shall make the apostles' confession our own. I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. In harmony with this experience is the command, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God does not bid you fear that he will fail to fulfill his promises, that his patience will weary or his compassion be found wanting. Fear lest your will shall not be held in subjection to Christ's will, lest your hereditary and cultivated traits of character shall control your life. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Fear lest self shall interpose between your soul and the great master worker. Fear lest self-will shall mar the high purpose that, through you, God desires to accomplish. Fear to trust to your own strength. Fear to withdraw your hand from the hand of Christ, and attempt to walk life's pathway without his abiding presence. We need to shun everything that would encourage pride and self-sufficiency. Therefore we should beware of giving or receiving flattery or praise. It is Satan's work to flatter. He deals in flattery as well as in accusing and in condemnation. Thus he seeks to work the ruin of the soul. Those who give praise to men are used by Satan as his agents. Let the workers for Christ direct every word of praise away from themselves. Let self be put out of sight. Christ alone is to be exalted. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, let every eye be directed, and praise from every heart ascend. The life in which the fear of the Lord is cherished will not be a life of sadness and gloom. It is the absence of Christ that makes the countenance sad, and the life a pilgrimage of sighs. Those who are filled with self-esteem and self-love do not feel the need of a living personal union with Christ. The heart that has not fallen on the rock is proud of its wholeness. Men want a dignified religion. They desire to walk in a path wide enough to take in their own attributes. Their self-love, their love of popularity and love of praise, exclude the Saviour from their hearts, and without him there is gloom and sadness. But Christ dwelling in the soul is a wellspring of joy. For all who receive him, the very keynote of the word of God is rejoicing. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. It was when Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock that he beheld the glory of God. It is when we hide in the riven rock that Christ will cover us with his own pierced hand, and we shall hear what the Lord saith unto his servants. To us, as to Moses, God will reveal himself as merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. The work of redemption involves consequences of which it is difficult for man to have any conception. Eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross, and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. Holiness finds that it has nothing more to require. God himself is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Great as is the shame and degradation through sin, 
even greater will be the honor and exaltation through redeeming love. To human beings striving for conformity to the divine image, there is imparted an outlay of heaven's treasure, an excellency of power, that will place them higher than even the angels who have never fallen. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth. Kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. End of chapter 13